screen. Good morning, DCF. I'm sorry I can't be with you this morning, uh, but I still am going to be praying that the Lord speaks to all of us through the message today and that touches our hearts deeply and in a profound way. I was realizing as I was preparing this week that I have been in a lot of church buildings. Uh, there's many reasons for that, one of which is that I have lots of life experience. Some would say I'm old, whatever you prefer. I also had two grandfathers who were pastors, and we used to visit them often. And as we would visit them, we would go to the churches that they were pastors in and hear them preach. I also was a youth pastor for over 20 years and a volunteer before that in a, in a youth ministry. So I have a lot of youth ministry reasons to go to other churches and see other churches. I've also had the pleasure and the uh, blessing to go overseas. And every time I went overseas, it was for a mission or for a ministry of some kind. And so all of those occasions I visited churches. So there's lots of reasons I have visited churches. I've seen a lot of them. Almost all of these churches had unique designs, special features to them, especially some of those older churches. Uh, and even on top of that, some of those older churches that had later additions added on and those transitions between the old and the new could sometimes make for some really interesting transitions there. Uh, some of them were spooky, I won't tell you why, uh, others had cool basements and storage areas and places to go in those buildings that made for some great hide-and-seek games, made for some great uh, times together with other kids. I have many fond memories investigating strange places in church buildings. None of them was identical to any other one. They all were different. Yet there was one thing, at least for the purposes of today's sermon, there was one thing that they all shared in common, and that was that they were places where the body of Christ gathered to worship God together. Today we're going to talk about another church building, well, another building, not a church, but a building where God's people met to worship him. And we're going to see this in Exodus 25 and then in Exodus 31. I invite you to turn in the Bible that you have there, either the one in front of you or the one you brought, uh, and find Exodus 25. Today we begin a new series, it's called Meeting with God, and it begins with a three-part mini-series on the ceremonial law. So today we'll be followed up by two more weeks of ceremonial law. It's instructions that God gives to guide the who, what, where, how, when, and why of worship for Israel. There's a big shift, as Pastor Brad said, in Exodus chapter 20. It goes from storytelling mode to instructional mode. Reading instructions is a little harder for me, not quite as exciting, but it's incredibly, vitally important nonetheless. The Bible tells lots of stories. I love stories. I love hearing stories. I love telling stories. We read the stories of the, the creation, the fall. We read stories about the people that lived at that time, some of them in rebellion to God and some others in obedience to God. Scripture tells of God choosing one man apart from all the rest, a man named Abraham, and that he wanted to bless the world through that man. The story is mostly confined to his family after Genesis chapter 12, and we see how God interacts with them. We see several generations thrive, and then many generations struggle in slavery after that. We're at the beginning point where that group is becoming a nation, being set free. Remember that they're only weeks, literally just weeks from their time as slaves, from the time they walked out. For us, it's been several months, but for them, it's been less than two, most likely. Remember that they uh, need to know how to function. And so God is giving them structure for governance and for worship. We saw the legal parameters given back uh, in God's law uh, in the last series. Now we're about to see the spiritual guidelines set in place and the rest of Exodus is preparations for worship and detailed instruction from God on how to do it. Well, let's begin. If you're able, I wanna ask you to please stand. I'd like to pray first. 
So join me as we pray to the Lord. Lord, we want to hear from you today. We're about to do the most important thing we could do, and that is to read your words. Nothing else we're going to hear today is as powerful and life-changing as your words. We want to hear from you, and indeed, we want to hear from you only. Speak to us loudly and clearly through the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amen. Starting in chapter 25, verse 1, I'll read the first nine verses, and then we'll go to chapter 31. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. <clears throat> Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And we're going to jump ahead to chapter 31. We're going to read the first 13 verses. <clears throat> Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Moreover, I have appointed Ohaliab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him, also, I have given skill to the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony with all the, atone, uh, with the atonement cover on it and all the other furnishings of the tent, the table and its articles, the pure gold lampstand and all its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offerings and all its utensils, the basin with its stand and also the woven garments, both the sacred garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests, and the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them just as I command them. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, for you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. That was God's word for us today. Thank you. You can be seated. <clears throat> the building of the tabernacle teaches us three things about how to meet with God. I'm sure that there are many more things we could learn, but three things that I pulled out of it to show you today. And the first thing it teaches us is that faith is individual and communal. <clears throat> the relationship with, that we have with God is individual. It is not corporate. Each one of us must have relationship with God on our own. I must be saved on my own. My salvation and my relationship with God cannot be experienced through someone else's. My parents, my wife, my siblings, my kids, none of them can extend their relationship with God to me, nor can I extend mine to them. So in that sense, our faith is individual and in many ways private. I should have my own individual time in the word with God. And in a lot of ways, that would be very private. I should also spend time in prayer on my own with God. Those would be very individual. There's many ways which my, my faith and my relationship with God is individual. But I'm also told to gather with others at prescribed times as well. There's an obvious communal aspect seen in the instructions for worship at this tabernacle. God expects them to gather regularly in this place as we saw in chapter 31 at the end. There was no margin or space for personal choice in the matter. There's no wiggle room for those who don't like it or don't want uh, to be tied down. They want their personal freedom. God's expectation was that his people would gather as a community at regular times. Those expectations haven't changed for us today. 
Hebrews 10 makes that abundantly clear to us. It says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As I read these verses, I get this sense that this meeting together that we must do to be in obedience to the Lord, this meeting together becomes more and more necessary every day as we get one day closer to the day the Lord returns. Every time we gather, we are a week closer to the day the Lord returns and it becomes more and more necessary as we see that day approaching to gather, to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, to encourage each other, to live for Jesus. We need to gather. We need to encourage each other. Yet today there's many people who find many reasons not to gather with the body. People who claim to follow the word and read the word and desire to obey it. People that say they love Jesus and want to follow Jesus and obey Jesus. Maybe it's sports. We've, we've had that come up in this place before. I mean, listen, football, softball, soccer, baseball, basketball, those are all communal events and sometimes worshipful, although not the worship of God. And sometimes the name of God and his son Jesus are invoked, but not in a worshipful tone. Sports are fun. Worship fulfills purpose. Maybe for some people, the live stream has become a problem. <clears throat> It's easy to just stay at home, to sit on the couch and not come, to leave the house and gather with his people. People who can get to the grocery store and the doctor's office and other needed places decide, I don't need to go to church. And I'm here to say, yes, you do. Number three, maybe you say church is full of hypocrites. I've heard a lot of people say this and I love it when people tell me that church is full of hypocrites. Pastor Brad and I were talking about this early in the week. I think a lot of people confuse imperfection with hypocrisy because we aren't perfect people. We have no right to tell people they should follow Jesus. The problem is that's not our message. Our message is not to be perfect. Our message is to call on the one who is perfect. That's why we talk about Jesus and we share the gospel <coughs> because people need Jesus. I don't think that's hypocrisy, that's just the truth. We can't live up to the standards that are taught in scripture, that's true, but we don't stop trying. We don't stop encouraging each other to do better, to be more like Jesus. Think about it in terms of sports and music and acting and other endeavors in life. If people gave up because they weren't perfect, would we have any of those things? A football quarterback, is not 100% every time. Does that mean he should just quit, give up? How about a musician practicing hard pieces of music, music that's beyond them? Should they give up because after a dozen tries they can't get it? They're not perfect? No, we keep striving to be more perfect and better all the time. It's the same in the Christian faith. And even then, if somebody says, yeah, I still think church is full of hypocrites, my message to them is, Hey, you know what? We'll scoot over and make room. You can come on in and we'll all go to Jesus together and receive his perfection for our imperfection. <clears throat> Another reason people don't come is because they say, I don't need church to be a Christian. I don't need church to follow Jesus. And that's true. Your salvation is not dependent on attendance at church. But if the body of Christ is missing some of its parts, and often many of its parts. How well does it function? How well does your body function when several parts of your body are not functioning up to code? Probably not very well, and you probably complain about it, right? Well, we deprive the body of Christ its full potential when we stay away. There's lots of reasons people stay away. There's lots of uh, reasons why people don't join the body of Christ on a weekly basis. Just understand this. We are to meet with God, yes, individually, and also corporately, communally. 
Well, the second thing it teaches us is that there's a right and wrong way to worship God. God establishes seven ceremonial feasts uh, throughout the year. We've seen some of those already. We'll see more as we keep reading through the Old Testament. And we're going to see very detailed prescribed ceremonial observances in the worship life of Israel. Pastor Brad will get more into that in the next couple weeks. So he talks about the priest role and the elements involved. So I just want to mention it here in regards to making this point. God didn't tell them, as long as you are sincere, as long as you are intending to worship me, as long as you do it in my name, whatever you do is fine. Just go ahead and do what is meaningful to you. He doesn't say that. He's very specific about what we are to do, when we are to do it, and for the purposes of this message, where it's supposed to happen. And in this case, the tabernacle that he gave instructions for, and later, a temple that Solomon builds. Location is an important element at this stage. By giving them a place to go, God forces the communal aspect to worship and meeting with God. They must offer sacrifices and they must be offered in one place. A place that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 12. It says this, Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, that's it, the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, there you are to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. There is a place to take all those things. Well, we do the same thing. We bring our tithes and offerings to a place and give it to the, the ministry of God's body. There's places all throughout the first five books. I just pulled one. There's over 30 of them where God refers to the place where the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. And that's where something is supposed to take place. <clears throat> That hasn't changed today. We talk about this at length in the sermon uh, on the second commandment, which was, hint, hint, July 9. If you want to go look it up, there's a lot of information in that sermon about this. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to dive into all that stuff again. You can go check out that sermon. But the point here is where we worship God communally is part of the right way to worship God. It's just a part of it. All right. The third thing the building of the tabernacle teaches us is that God chooses to dwell with us. God chooses to dwell with us. God has always intended to make his place among us for, uh, for his presence, and, and we see it all through Scripture. In Genesis 3, after sinning, we see Adam and Eve hiding from God because God was continually always present with them and hiding was an indication that they tried to flee his presence. It was nonstop and it was pleasant until that moment. That's why they're hiding. They hide to get away to no avail. In Genesis 12, we see the covenant with Abraham. We have referred to that often and we will continue to refer to it often. The, the three parts of that covenant are people, a place, and his presence. We see people, they're headed to a place, God is present. And really, all throughout history, every nation has had people in a place, but they haven't all had God's presence. The thing that makes the people and the, the place special is God's presence. We see several instances of God talking to Abraham talking to his son Isaac, talking to his son Jacob and his sons, the 12, all throughout Genesis. God is near, God is attentive, God is involved all through that book. We see God's presence all through Exodus as well, starting with a burning bush, 10 plagues, a pillar of fire and smoke. We see daily manna provided by the Lord. The people hear the voice of God. They saw the fire and smoke on the mountain felt the earth quake all around them, and they were terrified. They knew and experienced God's presence with them. And now we're seeing the tabernacle, and later the temple of God will have his presence among the people. 
He stated that as his purpose there in chapter 25 when he said, then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell with them. That's God's intention all along, to dwell with his people. There's always a place designated, a place for us to meet with God and be in his presence. Not because he needs it, but because we, we need it. So God gave them a special place, the tent called the holy place, the tent of meeting. Now that tent of meeting, that holy place, was a big tent pitched, pitched I'm sorry, inside this big rectangular courtyard that was cordoned off by other uh, walls. And those walls were big, heavy, thick curtains that separated this this uh, tabernacle area from the community area where people would live their normal lives. And so they could come into this open air courtyard area outside the tent of meeting. And it had special things that they could participate in, group things, communal things. Then there was this big tent, tent of meeting. And inside there, the priests would go to offer sacrifices, in particular um, incense every day, constantly. And then partitioned off one area inside that tent was the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. A place where only one man could go one time a year on the day of atonement, the high priest, and only on that day <coughs> could go into that area and offer a sacrifice, offer blood on the ark. God chose to make his dwelling in that place, in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And they knew it. They knew exactly where God dwelled in their midst. Well, the New Testament begins with Jesus being born, this special child. One of the special names he's given is Emmanuel, God with us. A new way of being present in the lives of his people has begun. Jesus dies, that curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place is torn in two, signaling that God will make his dwelling in each of us by means of the Holy Spirit. From then on, we see it begin in Acts chapter 2 with the beginning of the church. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it talks about how does God come and be present with each one of us? What is it that makes that work? Well, he says this, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, it's not enough to hear the gospel, you must commit to it. You must trust what Jesus did, that gospel of salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. When we accept Jesus, when we ask to be in relationship with him, to submit to his authority, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in each one of us. And then he's with us every moment of every day, just like he was with Adam and Eve. How awesome would that be? Yet the new church, the new believers that formed the new church continued to meet together regularly. They didn't say, well, I have the Holy Spirit in me. I don't need to gather they still met, they still gathered regularly. As the movement spread all over Asia and Europe, we see regular corporate communal gathering times for the church. Paul, John, James, Peter, Jude, they all write a bunch of letters to those groups of believers, those churches, places where the body of Christ would gather as a community. And in those letters, they encouraged and instructed them to keep meeting and how to keep meeting, how to worship the Lord. The use of the image of the body by Paul and all its parts functioning together shows us the communal flavor as well. Maybe today or sometime soon, check out 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12 and, and going to the end. It talks very specifically about all the parts of the body, things they do, things they shouldn't do, how they work together. We also see it in Ephesians chapter 4. Those passages tell us how important it is for us to be connected as often as possible to the body. Listen, the body needs all its parts. If you were to suddenly just take 
four or five just even minor parts of your body and take them off. Just rip them off and uh, you, you decided you didn't need those anymore. I guarantee you would notice. You would not function quite as well. It really isn't up for, to us to decide individually our involvement in the body. God has told us to do it. Let me close by asking this question. Does the Holy Spirit dwell in you? Is God present in your soul today? He is the deposit that guarantees our eternal inheritance, our eternal salvation. He told us, uh, Paul told us there in Ephesians 1 how it works. You hear the gospel, you hear about what Jesus did, his death, burial, and resurrection. His blood covers our sin, frees us from the guilt of our sins, takes it all upon himself, and he forgives it. We say, Lord, I want you to be my king. We submit to his authority, and when we do that, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. Listen to what Peter says in a sermon in Acts chapter 4. He says, salvation is found in no one else. He's referring to Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No other name. Salvation is totally dependent on calling on Jesus for your salvation. It's the only way we can really truly worship God. And it's the only way we can really truly be included in the body. I would urge you to call on him today. Join the body fully and completely. Please join me as I pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the body. Lord, I thank you for this church and what it has meant to me and my wife. I know we are encouraged every time we come into this place. We're encouraged to live for you. We're encouraged to keep on keeping on. Lord, I pray that we would do that for each other, that we would pray for each other and spur one another on toward love and good deeds, that we would never forsake meeting together for any reason that we would prioritize it above all else. Give us that conviction. Lord, I want to pray for anybody sitting in the room today who does not have a relationship with you because they've trusted in what Jesus did and does not have the Holy Spirit living in them. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they would call out to you. We ask this in Jesus' powerful, life-changing name. Amen. Amen. Let's respond by